Our wants aren't always good for us. And so it is actually a good thing for some of our wants not to be given to us. He's a good father. And he works all things, good and bad, together for the good of his children. He lets nothing go to waste because he loves you. As far as God is concerned, the end has been determined by him. What is your favorite restaurant? I want you for a moment to picture and think about what your favorite restaurant is. And to think about why that is your favorite restaurant. Is it a certain dish that they serve? Is it a drink that they serve? Is it the, the staff and the friendliness of the staff that makes you want to go back again and again? Well, let me tell you about mine. This is an excuse to talk about my favorite restaurants. It's called Dick's Taco. It's a Mexican restaurant. I pass by it every day on the way to and from this building. And I love going to Nick's Taco. But why do I love Nick's Taco so much? Because when I go there, I know that I'm going to get what I want. I know what to expect. I know that every time I go there, I can get a combination taco, which is amazing. I might try something new or try another taco that I've had before alongside it, but I know that every single time that I go, I can get that one combination taco, and it's going to be amazing. I go there, and I want to go there because I get what I want there. And that's what makes me think about, or I think about that when I look at this text and this passage. This passage helps to show us that as this whole chapter has shown us and will continue to show us the magnitude of God's love for his people. Every word in the Bible, but every word in this chapter in particular, speaks something of God's sacrificial love through Christ for his people. But there are unhelpful ways that we twist God's love for us. And in particular, how we twist what he says in his word in this particular passage that we are focusing on this morning. See, the big idea of the passage before us this morning is that because God loves us, Christians must be confident in his work. That's what Paul is laying out here in Romans 8. But the problem of this passage is this. We think that the passage says, God gives me what I want because he loves me. And so the Apostle Paul spends the course of this passage showing Christians three things that they must have. One, confidence when we pray. Two, confidence during the good and the bad. And three, confidence in the past and in the future. Those are the three things that Paul is laying out for us in this text. So, point one, the confidence when we pray. In last week's passage, we got to see how God works even in our suffering we saw how he and even how we and even the creation itself groans and longs for redemption. We long to be made new. In the midst of that, the Spirit is helping us to long for a hope that is now unseen, that even in the midst of trial and tribulation, the Spirit is pushing us forward to a future day where that hope would be fully realized. Well, here, the Apostle Paul continues in this theme of the Spirit's help. And the Spirit helps us, Scripture says, when we pray. Paul already spoke to the present suffering of the people, and now he turns to prayer. What harder time to pray than when you are suffering? What harder time to pray than when it feels like nothing has gone the way that you had wanted it to go, when you feel like all of your hopes have been dashed? What harder time to go before God and the Lord of all things? See, apart from Christ... Suffering only leads us to despair over our suffering or to self-righteousness in our suffering. See, we either become despondent or hopeless when we suffer and we can't see beyond it, or we become self-righteous about it. We look down on others who we consider who have suffered less than maybe we have. So in suffering, Paul says, what you need is the, ho the hope and the help of the Holy Spirit. You need him not merely to partner with you and to come alongside you, but you need him to indwell you, to intercede on your behalf, and to advocate for you in your prayers. If in our struggles to pray, then, the Spirit intercedes for us, well, how much more confidence would we have, then, to pray? The Holy Spirit is described in the New Testament as 
the helper, which is a word that is used to describe one who mediates on behalf of another in kind of a courtroom setting, right? So the picture is there is a judge and there's somebody who needs a mediator and someone comes in and they intercede on their behalf. I had the the privilege of going to jury duty recently and I got to see some of that happen. See, when we pray with groaning too deep for words or inarticulate groans, as you could translate it, it is the Spirit who intercedes on our behalf. It is the Spirit who gives words to our prayers when we have no words to pray. And it is the Spirit who gives us the groans towards future redemption that Paul had already talked about in the previous passage. It is the Spirit who prays on our behalf, but not just any prayer. He prays according to to the will of God. Isn't this amazing? That the fact that, that you go before the Lord, if you're anything like me, and you try and pray, you're often, you don't know what to pray. Well, Paul gives us the encouragement here that the Spirit does, and he prays and intercedes on your behalf. But how exactly does the Spirit know how to pray, or what to pray? How exactly does the Spirit know how to pray according to the will of God when we don't know how to pray according to the will of God? Because... The Spirit is God. That's how he knows. And he is our advocate. And he intercedes on our behalf when we don't have the words to pray. How does he know to pray according to the will of God? Because he himself is God. If you want to really tease Pastor Tag, have your kids explain that later and and have them ask Tag that later. See, for the Christian, that is who lives in them. That is who their advocate is. That is who intercedes on their behalf in their suffering. So he, brothers and sisters, gives us an unbounded confidence to pray to him, to go before him, to make our requests known to God, even when we don't know what to pray, how to pray, or even when we question our motives when we pray. He intercedes for us when we go before the Lord in prayer. But the passage does not stop there. God only wants us to have confidence when we pray, but he also wants us to have confidence during the good and the bad. The passage as a whole really centers around this one verse, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Although this verse is well known, although this verse is well rehearsed and recited by Christians, it is a verse that we wildly misunderstand at points. This verse has served as a go-to verse when we comfort somebody, when we comfort one another, when something really bad happens, or, or maybe to a friend who is suffering greatly. And although that is a great thing, that is a good thing, this is a good verse for those moments, I think sometimes we often misunderstand what the Apostle Paul is actually saying here. See, what we tend to hear in this verse is this. Because God loves us, he gives us what we want. Right? We tend to read verse 28 and say, yep, yeah, okay, so because God loves me, because he's working all things you know, for our good, yes, he's going to give me the things that I want him to give me. See, because God loves me, that means, of course, he's going to give me what I want. I'll get the things that I really desire, that I really earnestly desire, especially if I want it a lot. He's definitely going to give it to me. I will get the job that I really want. I will get the spouse that I really want. I will get into the school that I really want to get into. But that isn't what Scripture is saying in this passage. God doesn't say that because he loves us, we get what we want. God says here that because he loves us, he works all things together for the good of those who love him and know him by faith. He works what things? He works all things. If we misunderstand what the apostle is saying in this passage, then when things don't go our way, we will do this. We'll say, well, I guess God is gone. I guess he just doesn't care anymore. I guess he doesn't really love me because I didn't get what I wanted out of this situation. But that thinking is problematic for a couple of big reasons. First, it's not always good for us to get what we want, is it? I feel like anybody can be honest with themselves in that sense. Thinking back to Nick's Taco, I always want Nick's Taco. Always. There's hardly a day that goes by when I, when I would not go to Nick's Taco and eat there. But if I went there as often as I wanted to go there, would that be good for me? No. It would ruin me physically. It would ruin me financially if I went to Nick's Taco. It's expensive. 
Our wants aren't always good for us. And so it is actually a good thing for some of our wants not to be given to us. And the second problem with this type of thinking is that you and I have a multitude of desires and wants. And many of them compete with each other and contradict one another. I want to lose weight, but I really want cake. I want a great career that allows me to travel the world, but I also want a soulmate and a family. I want to be great at a musical instrument, but I want to have the freedom and flexibility in my schedule to do what I want when I want. Our wants constantly conflict with one another. And so when they conflict with one another, how can we even tell them apart? And further, how can we even begin to decide which one is which, and which one do we choose, and which one not to choose? See, this passage is helping us to see that God works all things together for the good of those who know him, not just the things that we want him to. Now, I know what you, and especially Christians in the room who've been in this for a long time, you might be thinking this, you might be, okay, God, you know, doesn't give me what I want, but he gives me what I need. I hear you. <laughs> but if you're a parent, or right, if you're a mom or a dad, is that what you want your kids to say about you? Like, I love my mom and dad because they don't give me what I want, but they give me what I need. No. No one wants their kids to say that about them. And that is why this passage is so important. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and trust him by faith. That means even things we enjoy. That means even good things, the things that we would consider good and enjoyable. See, apart from him, we are tempted to view the successes and triumphs and good things of our lives as having come solely from us. But in him, Christians that, e that, that see that even these things, even the good things that we have, like Nick's Taco, are gifts of God's grace by him to us to enjoy. That the good things that we have, that the successes that we have, the triumphs that we have, these are all gifts of God's grace to his people. He's a good father, and he works all things, good and bad, together for the good of his children. He lets nothing go to waste. This is why a lot of evangelism happens through hobbies. He works even things that we enjoy together for the good of those who know him. See, not only does he work the suffering and family strife and conflict and being laid off of a job together for the good of those who love him, he also works the successes and triumphs and laughter and joys and food together for the good of those who love him. Why? Because he loves you. That's why you can be confident in the good and the bad. Why? Because he loves you. He is not an indulgent grandfather who just gives you whatever you want. And he's not a stoic, intense father that only shows up when, you're, when he's angry with you. No, he is a good father, and he's working all things together for the good of his children. That is who he is. Or in a famous quote, says it this way, Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing is needful that he withholds. All things together for the good of his children, brothers and sisters. But as this passage continues, we see that God is calling Christians to have confidence in one more thing. Confidence in the past and in the future. So we know that God is working all things together for the good of his children. But what is the good that Paul is writing about in the first place? What is the good that he's speaking of? If your parents tell you to eat vegetables and terrible vegetables like peas and, 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 and you don't want to eat peas, but they respond, you, know, you ask them, why should I eat these things? And they say, because they're good for you. That's not really a compelling reason, is it? So what is the why to this? What is the good that Paul is talking about, that God works all things together for his children? Well, Paul answers that in these two verses where he, Scripture says this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The good that God is working all things together for, for his children, is this, his calling, his justifying, and his glorifying of them. 
The good that God is working all things, good and bad, together for is what Paul describes here. This passage describes those who love God, as we saw in verse 28, as as those who have been foreknown by him. What does that word foreknown mean? The Greek word for foreknowledge is is, uh, prognosko, which is the word, we're kind of where the word prognosis comes from. So a doctor's prognosis is is the doctor saying that he knows how the patient will progress. But what does Paul mean when he uses the word foreknowledge here in this passage? This is a controversial word. Is he saying that God knew ahead of time those who would love him? Or is he saying that God chose those who love him so that they would love him? Well, this word is used throughout the New Testament as well as in the Greek version of the Old Testament, which Paul would have known and had access to, uh, to describe actually the latter action. The word is used in the Old Testament to describe God's choosing of his people Israel over all the families of the earth. In Acts 2 at Pentecost, Paul uses this same word to describe Jesus being handed over to the people by God's definite plan and foreknowledge. And later in this same letter, in Romans 11, Paul says that God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So when this word is used in the Bible, it speaks not of God knowing a future action or choice that his people would make, but it establishes a relationship between God and his elect prior to even the creation of the world. But even if you disregard all that, just look at the text with me this morning. When this word is used... Again, it's being used to describe God's acting. And if you look at this text, who is doing the action? It's God. He predestined those. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Look at who is doing the action. Who is doing the working in this text? It is God and God alone. And he's doing it, he's breaking into the hearts of his people so that they would know him and trust him and be conformed to the image of his son, so that they would be made new. See, that is the good that he is talking about in this passage. He's saying that God works all things, good and bad, together so that his children would be made more and more like his son. Those whom he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, he called to himself, which is where he persuades us of our sin, and he shows us that Christ is the only way of salvation, that we would embrace him as our Savior. Those whom he called, he also justified, which is God's act of free grace, where God pardons those who trust him by faith, and he accepts them as righteous based not on anything that we did, but based on what Christ has done for us, given to us. But then he closes the passage in a really weird way, right? He says, he says whom he, he, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Scripture says that those who he, he, he justified are glorified, but glorification is usually a word that refers to something in the future, right? It's used to describe the glory that is to come. It typically speaks of the new heavens and the new earth where Christians are given new bodies to live in perpetual sinlessness forever. That is what we have to look forward to. But why is Paul using that word in the past tense in this passage? I mean, we clearly are not living in the new heavens and the new earth, right? We clearly are living in a fallen world. The church in Rome in the first century was clearly living in a fallen world. But here's what Paul is doing here. He is saying that as far as God is concerned, the end has been determined by him. The glory of his people, they're being made like his son Jesus, having him as their king, having him as their older brother. God will see fit that that will happen to each and every one of his children. That's what this passage is showing us. You see, These verses, and these two verses in particular, aren't just material for us to argue about predestination. That's not the point of this passage. There's a time and place. It's not the point of the passage, though. This is here so that the Christian would read this and have confidence in God's calling of him or herself. So that they would have confidence knowing that the destination that God is going to bring them to, they will get to. 
It's not merely that, that, uh, that, that we, we, we show up at a gas station and, and, and God puts a bunch of oil in the tank and then we have to just see fit to get to the destination. No, he brings us there. The Christian is to know that they are God's and that if they do indeed belong to God, that God himself is using all things in their life, good and bad, to be made more like the Son. But if you are here this morning and you don't know Christ, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear that this is some fatalistic passage that therefore makes it irrelevant to how you and I respond to it. No, Scripture doesn't do that with this. Just as Paul sees fit for the first century church in Rome to hear and be comforted by these words, so for you today, the offer of salvation is here. And it is freely given to be received by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And if we look at this passage and we look at the confidence that we are to garner and get from this passage, and if we are to realize and see that we cannot have that confidence in anyone or anything else, it would be crazy to reject him. See, because God loves us, the Christian must be confident in his work. They must be confident in prayer, confident in the good and bad, and confident in the past and the future working of God. And by his grace, he gives that confidence to us. 